So why do voices from the margin matter? I think for those of you who are here this morning, you already have a great knowledge and recognition of why voices in the margin matter. But I entertain this question, thinking about what it meant when I began to work in ministry to serve those who needed me and others to help give authentication to their voices, whom sometimes the world, societies, somehow chose not to recognize. We need people to listen and to be attentive to the voices in the margin. Because in the margin, there's suffering. There's neglect. There's discontentment. There's a discounting of lives. And sometimes there's an absence of hope. But also in the margin, there is strength. There are champions. Those with a fierce hope and a determined perspective that their voices count, their stories matter, and their journeys will end in the places in which they have sought the halls of justice, the centers of power, the places with the privilege to name. I'm remembering that when I began ministry after seminary in the first uh, congregation that I had the opportunity to serve was a congregation uh, in the foothills of Southwest Virginia. I've mentioned this before, but I'm thinking about it now because I remember when folks used to say that there, there was, was nothing uh, east of, of Charleston, West Virginia, uh, nothing west of uh, Richmond, Virginia. It was kind of a wilderness area to be. And as much as I could not think about Tazewell, Virginia, with the population of maybe uh, at that time, maybe around 3,000, being a metropolis. But when I was uh, invited to visit a church that was somewhere in between uh, Rocky Gap and Bluefield, West Virginia, um, we, to get there, we had to go some, down this long, curvature, meandering kind of road uh, down in, in, towards the, the valleys there. And I joke about it now because when I went there, it was in the dead of night, and it was one of those places where after the service had ended, and folks said, uh, Reverend, uh, are you going to need someone to show you how to get out of here? <laughs> and I did. <laughs> but one of the things I didn't realize after being with uh, that church and, and, and the folks there, it was one of those, uh, it was a tiny church, uh, with a huge minister. Uh, when I say huge, it's not only his size, but it was just his kind of charismatic nature. Uh, and Reverend Wilson, uh, th that I met there, he began to come to uh, Taswell for some services on Sunday morning. And as people began to recognize who he was, he was somewhat uncomfortable for the folks that were in this, quote, mainline Protestant church that I was serving. And so Reverend Wilson, when he would come, uh, it, the elders would begin to come to the, the office, my office, before service would begin, and they would say, uh, 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 Reverend Wilson is here this morning. Uh, wonderful. Uh, no, Reverend Wilson is here this morning. <laughs> and the reason is because, well, Reverend Wilson, he would have his seat in the 
the area where the ministers would sit. And at the very beginning of worship, it was time for the call to worship. But rather than just the call to worship, Reverend Wilson would have a testimony. And it was something like, well, folks, when I think about the goodness of God and, and all God's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah, I thank God for saving me. But he didn't stop there. <laughs> he had a song. Do you know the one? Do you know the one? Do you know the one from Galilee? Jesus went down to the Jordan and he go to Calvary. Mm, do you know the one from Galilee? And he just keeps singing. And they wonder when in the world we were going to get to the call to worship. And the thing that it seemed to me as I think about it in, in, in sharing with you this morning is I, I don't think that they were as frustrated about Reverend Wilson's charismatic nature nor the obvious limitations of his former education, not even his poverty. I think that what frustrated them the most, because this, again, mainline Protestant church, it was a church that was very proud of its heritage, proud of its position in the community. I mean, in this church, uh, mostly African Americans, but these were African Americans who, in that area who had most often, they had worked in the homes of judges and worked in the homes of, a, of attorneys, uh, worked in, in, in roles with the uh, roles with the community colleges, and oftentimes they felt that they had accomplished uh, much in their lives, and they had. But they had lived their lives trying their best to get to the center. And so Reverend Wilson, he represented an obvious impatience with conformity. It's something that often people who are part or want to belong to communities, especially communities of faith, they sometimes become very frustrated when they feel as if the community to which they want to belong, that is something, so to speak, countercultural, and yet it seems that there is a bit of acculturation that takes place. So much so that people begin to, to feel uh, a bit anxious about it. They begin to wonder if this, only, if this is the community that, 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 that they should belong to at all. I mean, they, they become frustrated because things aren't moving fast enough. They want things to speak against what's happening with the present culture. It reminds me of the early church. Even its very nature, when it began, it was countercultural. And so sometimes people, be, with their frustrations, they begin to say, I need a church that's on fire. I need a church that's more charismatic. And in talking with Phil after services this morning, uh, Phil really just made me laugh because he said, you know, those churches that you're talking about, he says it even reminded me of one of those stories. And I wish Phil were here to share it instead of me because I, it was much funnier when he told me. But he said that it reminded the stories of, of some of those churches. It reminded him of the, the story of the, the folks who went down to a church it was just a one concrete building. Uh, there was a door to get in, and that was it, just one door. And then you go into the place of worship. And he says, the only thing is, Mark, is that's different about your story and mine is that the story I learned was a story that everything was, 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 was charismatic. Everybody was just on fire, and everybody was just excited. But there were two boxes that were sitting in the corner. And the boxes had a blanket over it. And about that time, someone looked in the box and realized what might just be in there moving. And so the, the sibling looked over to his sister 
And he said to her, this is according to Phil. He said, where's the exit door? And his sister said, there isn't one. Well, tell me where they would like an exit to be. <laughs> it's just something about the nature of who we are as communities and what we're comfortable with. One of the voices that encouraged me to consider another path other than that one that I had intended. When I was an undergraduate, and as much as I love the sciences, the voices of Dr. King and his messages, they just continue to resonate with me. There's service to be done. There's justice to be served. There are causes of peace to be authenticated. And I wanted to be a part of it. But as much as the voice of Dr. King invited people to join the movement, that movement to eradicate racism and those ills of injustice in society, the voice of Martin Luther King Jr., it was more of a voice that spoke to the churches, that critiqued the churches who were comfortable in their conformity. And Dr. King said, yes, I see the church as the body of Christ, but oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect and through fear of being non-conformist. We recognize what it means to live in the center, to have our education in the center, to have our lives authenticated in the center. But John the Baptist, John the Baptist represented a voice that was original. And for the centers of power, John the Baptist was problematic. Wearing rough garments made from camel's hair, and, which was the common clothing of the nomadic Arabs of the desert, ingesting the ritually clean food of locusts and wild honey, a food that was, was kept by those who were the poorer people of the desert, still eaten to the day, this present day, John the Baptist was a charismatic. He was a preacher on fire, an obscure wilderness prophet. And he was also an apparent self-sufficient ascetic who was a threat to the established temple traditions of the Sadducees as well as the Torah schools of the Pharisees. That's why Matthew points out that John the Baptist, when he saw the Sadducees and the Pharisees coming into the wilderness, because th that was something that was a, a great reversal that was occurring. Because in, during that time in history, and maybe even in the present, um, you went to the center for your needs. But because of the ministry of John the Baptist, the center had begun coming to the margins. And John the Baptist critiqued the Sadducees and the Pharisees because he said to them, who warned you, you vipers, to come? The critique was of their teaching. The Sadducees who wanted to continue to teach a certain loyalty to the temple and to the rituals that would satisfy what they considered to be atonement, acts of atonement. The Pharisees who wanted to pile upon the laws even more restrictions, even more burdens upon God's people. 
John the Baptist rejected all of that. He said coming into the wilderness is, is almost like the snakes when the wilderness is on fire. And you start skirmishing away. Who told you to flee? John the Baptist offered a baptism to the people who came to the wilderness, and it was a baptism that was beyond the, the purifications. John the Baptist began to teach the people who came to the margins that their baptisms actually could represent the lives of people committed to a righteousness that went beyond what they could perceive. It went into generations that would come after them who would receive a grace and a mercy and a hope that only the God who had spoke to their ancestors in the wilderness could give. The margins, the wilderness became a place, a school of teaching, of acceptance, and of recognition that God's glory was bigger even than they could consider the life of Abraham to have been. And so John the Baptist taught on the margins that there was a transition that was occurring. And when Jesus comes to the Jordan, one of the greatest acts of leadership is taught to us in Matthew chapter 3. Sometimes there are leaders who cannot accept their limitations, and that becomes a hindrance. John the Baptist accepted his limitation. John the Baptist said, there is someone who's coming after me who is more worthy, more mightier than I am. Someone whose sandals I am even unworthy to undo. And John the Baptist was willing to allow his position to diminish so that the capacity of Jesus' leadership could increase. Matthew chapter 3 is also uh, to be read adjacent to Matthew chapter 11. The reason why? Because even though John the Baptist was present, could accept Jesus Christ, heard the voice that spoke on the margins that said that this is my son, my beloved in whom I'm well pleased, John the Baptist was still concerned with judgment. And when John the Baptist began to hear that through Jesus' baptism and ministry, that Jesus was offering even forgiveness, acceptance, and inclusion to the very ones who John the Baptist had railed against. John the Baptist led from the margins. Jesus taught that there are even margins in the center. And that's why Matthew chapter 11 teaches that Jesus went into the city. And so the announcement in Matthew chapter 3 speaks to the very question that John the Baptist would ask later. Are you the one? Are you really the one? Or should we look for another? But that's a purpose for the announcement on the margins is that our baptisms are the signs of the real presence and power of Christ in our lives, a symbol of God's redemptive actions. Our baptisms represent God's voice from the margins of societies, bearing witness to a greater community to which each of us belong. Through our baptisms, we are a, a covenantal family who have been sealed as the believers in Christ's redemption and having our re identities renewed through the purposes of God. Why do voices from the margin matter? Because the voices from the margin often convict us when we have compromised our integrity and when we have lost our convictions for what God has first called us to. 
not only the voices of the Richard Wilsons or the Nathan Phillips, the Native American who was ridiculed uh, so tremendously so just a few days ago when he offered the song of the um, Native American movement. The voices from the margins matter because the voices from the margin, they represent the affirming voice of the triune God who was manifested to those who wondered if there was ever any hope for them at all. The voices from the margin teach us that it is a community of faith that has a responsibility of afflicting those who are comforted or comfortable and giving comfort to those who have been afflicted. The prophet John the Baptist was affirmed at the margin. God's voice was heard affirming Jesus as a leader of God's beloved community. God's son in whom God was well pleased. And so among the many powers and privileges of the center is the power to name things. But that is also the power of our baptisms. But it is a power that didn't come from the society's center, but rather they originate from the margin of Judea. In the proclamations of the wilderness prophet, whom God named as John the Baptist, was the belief that our baptisms, they represent God's fulfillment of a promise of God's Yeshua, God's Messiah, the transforming of a world and the renewing of a people. When, I, when growing up in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, my home, it was a place that often felt like a wilderness to me. It felt like a wilderness because I did not often see people who, who represented me. I didn't see people who were lawyers that looked like me. I didn't see doctors who looked like me. I didn't see many people in leadership that looked like me. It always seemed as if people like me were not recognized. How would I know? that through the work of an English professor at North Carolina State University, that someone came to the wilderness of Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, and offered a voice that all the world would later hear. But that voice first spoke in the wilderness of Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And you get to hear a portion of that voice. Thank you. 